Okay, let's start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I trust that you're doing fine today. To begin with, ISO 24, Lockpoint and Cyberint want to thank you for attending this one hour webinar today. This particular session is about maximizing the efficiency of security operations by using SIEM together with specific threat intelligence. Today, we will particularly focus on combining the force of the Lockpoint SIEM SOAR and UEDA solution together with the Cyberint attack surface monitoring capabilities. With us today are Eddie Almer, Director of Product Management at Lockpoint, and Gino Rombley, the Senior Team Lead of Solution Engineering at Cyberint. Welcome, gentlemen, and great to have you in today. The agenda for today's session is as follows. Starting with this welcoming and introduction to both solutions, followed by challenges faced by security teams as seen from vendor perspective, then a quick introduction to both solutions, an integration and synergy and a real world scenario explanation. Then we will start with the questions and answer. Of course, you can ask your questions during the session via chat and we will respond to as many questions as possible during the Q&A. And then the closing part. This entire session will also be recorded and made available after the session. To start with, I would like to say a few words about Lockpoint and Cyberint from ISO 24's perspective. Let's start with a bit of history and how and why ISO 24 selected both Lockpoint and Cyberint for its portfolio. Cyberint started work, ISO 24 started working with Lockpoint 12 and a half years ago, and ever since the Lockpoint solution has evolved from just a log management SIEM only solution to what Lockpoint is today a converged theme for today's SOC supporting detection, automation, hunting, and responding to a diversity of threats with their diverse and open platform. The Lockpoint solution is easy to install, implement, and maintain, and has a very straightforward non-EPS-based pricing model without any surprises. The solution can also be used for security for business critical applications such as SAP, and a large variety of vendors, sources, and use cases are supported out of the box. Logpoint, based in Denmark, is a full European vendor supporting organizations all over the world in various industries with their cybersecurity challenges. Whilst Logpoint is part of the ISO 24 portfolio ever since the ISO 24 existence, the Cyberin solution was added to the ISO 24 portfolio almost two years ago. Cyberint is a highly skilled developer of software that fuses real-time threat intelligence with attack surface management. With a team of 160 employees, they provide organizations with integrated visibility into their external risk exposure. Cyberint's proactive Argos platform leverages autonomous discovery on all external facing assets coupled with open, deep, and dark web, web intelligence, thereby allowing cybersecurity teams to uncover their relevant known and unknown digital risks. The power of the Cyberint proposition is that it can also be used to enrich other security solutions in order to create more context to these external cyber threats we're facing. The solutions of Cyberint are available for the purpose of phishing, attackware, brand protection, data leakage, and fraud. Supply chain threat intelligence is the latest addition to their portfolio. Cyberint works with organizations all over the world to help them gain insights in their attack surface to reduce risk and strengthen their overall security. Both Lockpoint and Cyberint complement each other in various ways. In the next 50 minutes, we will introduce you to the challenge challenges that are faced by security teams nowadays and how these can be solved by using Lockpoint and Cyberint. We will also tell you more about the do's and don'ts as well as some of the pitfalls to avoid when implementing these solutions. So without further ado, let's continue the conversation together with Eddie and Gino. First, I would like to ask you the following regarding the discussion on the threat landscape and the challenges many organizations face in effectively detecting and responding to cyber threats 
I would like to ask you both to elaborate a bit more on the following statements. Given the ever-evolving threat landscape, what are some of the most significant challenges organizations encounter in effectively detecting and responding to cyber threats? Gino, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, Mark. Uh, thank you again for having us here on this webinar. The challenges that we see that a lot of organizations um, have is the ability to detect, let's say, the things that they don't let's say are related to them, but they have absolutely no control of it. Um, what we see when we look in terms of the uh, digital footprint of an organization, um, it, over the last, let's say five to 10 years, especially leveraging cloud services, uh, services, this has evolved and become more and more bigger, more larger uh, digital footprint, which means to say from a hacker perspective, the attack surface, um, 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 let's say presence or itself has become even more bigger. So hackers have multiple areas where they can target an organization. And what we see that organization uh, struggle with is to maintain their current, let's say, um, uh, digital footprint because it's eversely growing. So why the IT uh, security team are responsible for managing certain assets, uh, their assets are being spun up out of their control and they have no visibility of that. So where we see that where they don't have any visibility, it opens a, a gap or area of attack uh, to the organization. And organizations are trying more and more to get a more better grip on their attack surface, um, trying to understand where and when certain um, assets have been spin up, but more importantly, kind of correlating them to the threats that are out there. So when we look at initial attack vectors, um, mainly around vulnerabilities, phishing, or even leak credentials. These are becoming stuff that uh, are, are partly in control of the business because some of these vulnerabilities um, uh, exploits uh, is found on their assets or the technologies that they use. But on the other hand, they're, they're, they're part of a vendor that's creating the technologies. So they, they, they have no control what to do. They need the technology to execute their business. And once the exploit is found, they, they have little and nothing they can do other than maybe shut the service down for a time being until there's a patch. So organizations overall see challenges in these three areas, and um, there they'll want to get better visibility of the attack surface in order to mitigate these risks. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Gino. Um, would you like to add to that, uh, Eddie, from your perspective? Yeah, uh, I think threat intelligence is a very important part of the story. It's getting harder and harder to detect something happening without having something to pinpoint you. Or even more important, as in the case of cyber, and this is taking us beyond the basic threat intelligence where we're looking for IOCs, for IPs, for file signatures. <laughs> and Cyberint is looking beyond that and is bringing very useful data. And uh, we're going to talk about some of these uh, types of data when we talk about the integrations. Each and every one of those types of data is useful. And to make it really useful for the end user, we have to make it really easy for them to consume the data. Uh, and this is where automation comes in. So not only are we using that data and correlating it with our logs, uh, the various logs that the customer collects and helping them uh, bring forward the more risky components uh, based on that threat intelligence, but we're also doing that automatically. And I'm going to show some of that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, also looking at the, uh, at the aspect of threat intelligence, what you just mentioned, threat intelligence and SIEM, evolving in the context of modern cybersecurity operations, especially also with the rise of sophisticated cyber attacks. How do you see the role of threat intelligence and, and SIEM in that perspective? Can you say something about that, uh, Eddie? Yeah, so I think uh, threat intelligence is becoming a, a, a table stakes. You pretty much every organization needs and can benefit 
from uh, threat intelligence coming in, in terms of both detecting stuff otherwise they wouldn't see at all, and in terms of prioritizing all the existing alerts that they're seeing and deciding which of them is more relevant and more important to them. And I promised some examples. So for example, if you're getting an, uh, a list of IP addresses, that's nice. But imagine you're getting uh, information from the dark web about leak credentials. Uh, CyberInt is able to tell you that somebody out there is selling the following usernames and passwords in your organization to whoever is willing to pay. Or maybe they're trying to extort you and they just expose it to the world for free. But usually they'll try to make money off both sides. So not only are they stealing those from you, they're also selling it to somebody who would actually attack you. Um, if you're receiving a list of a dozen or a hundred of those credentials that were leaked, it's going to take you a lot of time to actually realize, okay, so all of those were leaked. Which one is most likely to cause damage immediately? Which one uh, can be used in an attack? Even more interesting, which one is currently being used in an attack? Is anybody attacking one of those dozen or 100 uh, credentials and using them to uh, attack the organization? So um, that, once automated, can be uh, presented together. So basically, both pieces of the puzzle are presented to the analyst together allowing that analyst to respond quickly and to decide, okay, maybe I want to suspend a user uh, until they change their password. Maybe uh, I want to allow some users to continue working because I don't see any problem for them yet. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I can validate whether they already changed their password in the past 48 hours or two weeks. So this leak is older than that. So we already know that although we got that information, we've checked and now it's no longer dangerous to us. All of those things can be done uh, automatically and we can get a lot of value from leak credentials. And there'll be additional examples. CyberInt has a fairly rich set of external uh, attack surface information. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Um, uh, would you like to add to that, uh, Gino? Absolutely, uh, Mark, it, and, and I just have to chime in. I mean, uh, like Eddie explained, right, the additional of context of what's being detected within your, your, your infrastructure is very important. So we've been in a period for about, let's say, five to maybe a decade of being IOC driven, right? Um, these are the typical IOCs we've seen from certain threat actors. Um, but threat actors have become more clever now because, again, if they've spotted or someone identify one of their uh, infrastructure that's being used to target a victim, they're not going to use the same uh, infrastructure again. They're going to try to use another one. So it's very important that while you receive these IOCs and you're looking internally to detect it, what is the context? And that's where Cybering kind of complements Lockpoint in this examples of I have an IOC, I have some file hashes. Um, could you identify maybe, hey, um, is this, can this attribute to a particular threat actor or ransomware group or even more? So um, that is the area where we as Cyberin, you know, as a, as a threat intelligence company, provide a lot more context, not only around your attack surface, but looking at it from a, let's say, uh, a broader view of if someone were to target your organization, what context um, are they using and what methods are they using to target you? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Gino. Um, I, I think bringing more context in, uh, in line of the, the solution of law point where you can get more value from your threat intel combined with, uh, with what you're signaling, signaling in the environment might, uh, might uh, uh, surely help. What do you consider are some of the, well, the common pitfalls that organizations should avoid? When, when, uh, when implementing threat detection and response strategies. And also perhaps something uh, a little bit more, more about what strategies they can employ to, to overcome these. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a bit on that, Addy? Yes, 
So threat detection is becoming harder and harder and threat detection engineering is becoming its own expertise. We have people that were, that is their job. And um, one pitfall is trying to build everything on your own. Um, wherever you can get already prepared and tested detections from a vendor or from a service provider, that would quite likely be very useful for most small, medium, and even some of the smaller, large organizations would benefit from actually consuming uh, content from a service provider or uh, from a vendor that is actually building those detections for all their customers and is able to invest more resources than a single uh, detection team can. Okay, do you know what's your uh, what's your uh, your view on that? Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 it's. I I've seen a couple of organizations, especially when it comes to enhancing their the detection, is um, the more they consume, the better they have better um, um, visibility, which is not entirely true, right? So if you are consuming sources, in this case of IOCs that are um, only looking at a certain part of an area or maybe an area that your business doesn't do um, any business in, then you're looking in the wrong area. Um, so what I what I always recommend to my my prospects and customers is to try to understand the vertical or understand the way your business operate. So if you're in a manufacturing area, a manufacturing sector, you're based in a certain country, there are certain threats that's relevant for the country and there's relevant threats for the sector. And if you combine the two, maybe the threats that's relevant for the country may not be relevant for the sector. Or if you go outside of Europe, it may be, maybe is so. So try to really understand the way your business functions, try to understand the geo, geo location, try to understand the geopolitical situations and try and focus on those to have those relevant threats to be consumed within your um, uh, detection system, such as a lock point. And then there you can say, okay, does make sense that we do see an increase of certain phishing campaigns in this particular part of the world um, because of the political sensitivity of certain topics that have been discussed in the area that we function out of business. And that way, you know, you adjust that 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 that, that requirement uh, based on um, your stakeholders, your internal stakeholders, the business, and that way you have more better visibility of what you should be focusing on. So try to avoid, you know, uh, just say, oh, I just have a feed, it's got some nice IOCs, let's consume all of them. What you're gonna get is an overload of noise uh, that is gonna make the team um, stress and, and, and not looking at the real threats and, and yeah, create a lax in the company. So you really wanna focus on, try to understand the core of your business, how do they operate, what is important, and then focus on the sources that you need your collection. And then while you start to go on that journey, you do your detection, you will identify a gap, and then you can close that gap by looking and say, okay, where can maybe find to buy maybe complementary sources or purchase some commercial sources in order to uh, close that gap. Absolutely. And maybe um, one more important pitfall that is almost obvious, but it still happens. If you remember that picture of two guys trying to push a heavy load and somebody comes to them with the wheel and they say, no, 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 we don't have time. We're overloaded with what we're currently doing. So automation is, is here to help exactly with that. And mm -hmm. sometimes you may think that doing an automation project is too much, but the problem is not doing it is worse. Um, and we are here to help. So there is a bunch of stuff that will be ready out of the box. For example, the playbooks we're going to show for our cyber end integration, those can be made available to any of the customers interested as part of the base uh, offering. And if you need additional help, then of course we are here to help you further 
and even uh, do adaptations for whatever you need. So we allow you to actually truly get value out of, of that data, because if you're getting a lot of data, so much data that you're not able to make good use of it, then yeah. you're not getting the value that you deserve to get uh, from, from what you're paying for. And we're here to make sure that you do. Yeah. So true. Okay, thank you very much uh, both for your uh, explanation on the challenges faced by security teams nowadays. And uh, I'm sure that the uh, that the attendees have uh, have heard a, a lot of tips and tricks in the part in which you explain the pitfalls and how to how to cope with that and how to make sure that that's not going to happen in uh, in in certain situations. Uh, great, thank you, uh, thank you, Eddie and Gino. Um, yeah, in order to familiarize everyone a bit more with the solutions we are discussing today. We would like to introduce you a bit more in depth to both technologies. Um, Gino, can you please provide us with a brief presentation or explanation highlighting the capabilities of the Cyber and Threat Intelligence Platform, focusing on how it empowers organizations to proactively identify and mitigate uh, cyber threats? Yeah, sure. Um, just uh, for clarity, everyone can see my um, screen. Yep, I can see your you. screen. Yes. All right. So I, I'm not going to go in more in depth, in, but the the idea of our solution in in the whole is um is to pretty much provide impactful intelligence. Um, what we mean by that is we're only going to share with you the alerts that we feel is very important for you to 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 see. So basically, um, um, as as a user of Cyberin, um, there are lists of alerts that are generated by the platform. And typically, we if I put them in a category, and we've shown in multiple carry fraud, phishing, attack, we have brand data. Um, I've selected a couple of them that will be relevant for you to see. So here, um, in this example, um, we have a couple, let's say, um, uh, of alerts that are relevant for you to 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 focus on, and some of them um, helps you to reduce the noise as well. So, for example. I'll start with something that uh, is pretty common in the exposed credential world. Um, here you see this is a, a company employee third party credentials exposed. Third party is the key word in this alert. This is not something that has been seen, uh, let's say, uh, within the organization. This is seen just being circulating, right? This this Something like this is what consumes a lot of time of the SOC analysts and CTI analysts, like, oh, again. And you can see here, password most likely would not fit the password policy. So when we see this, we say, hey, we've seen this being circulating. We'll let you know how many times it's been seen. And yeah, there's just a username and password. And this is the uh, source that's been just circulating, right? Just a simple, you know, couple of text files. And you can see some of these go even like like, like years, like, like in this case, some, some weeks back. But this has just been constantly circulating through multiple text files. So when 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 the users see something like this, they're like, okay, good. We don't really need to action on something that's on, on, on like this. What they want to see is something that's really important in terms of a malware, right? So malware will be something very interesting. Um, what you see in terms of malware is that um, we, we have an individual. In this example, uh, we have an, an employee, right? their device is, is infected with malware. If you're familiar with InfoStealers, what InfoStealer does is just simply steal your credentials from your browser, your cookies, um, everything that's like relevant for you, and then package it up and then have it being sold or dropped on, a, on in Telegram or have it prepared to be sold on the dark web. So in this example, you know, employee machine is infected by malware. We give you the details, we show you the infected host so they can quickly identify, okay, where, where which, which device is it? But we also provide it the level of screenshots. So this example, where you see the Okta credentials have been compromised, username and password. Uh, you see as well the files were grabbed. So this is very important when it comes to leak documents, leak information. You can see that some information have been leaked regarding to the company. Um, screenshots has been made, which is also considered leak information. This is a device fingerprint. So this helps the SOC analyst to say, okay. Is this a personal machine or is this a, a corporate machine? Um, and then more importantly, has there, have, have any cookies been stolen? 
So I know a lot of people have implemented MFA, which is pretty good, but as you're probably aware, um, the cookies have a validity, right? If there's a persistent cookie that hackers get in time, they can bypass the MFA. And this is what hackers are trying to get, get that cookie in time so they can bypass the MFA. And then more importantly, we kind of provide a context where this, this individual works for, where, 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 where he's stationed at. And all this information, as you can see here, are collected in our platform. And this is shared then an example with Lockpoint for them to say, okay, um, this is the level of information that we've collected. See if you find this, uh, which is more important, see if you find any C2, so command and control uh, communication from any devices within your network uh, with a C2. If yes, then you know, okay, this managed to infiltrate our, our network. So this is information that we share with Lockpoint. The analysts can pick it up on their end and then they can action on it. And once they've actioned on it, then they can just term, just say, acknowledge, close the alert and say it's resolved and then move on to the next. Okay, thank you for this detailed explanation of, uh, of Cyber and Gino. We will uh, jump into, into the integration and synergy in the real world scenario in the, in the next chapter. But uh, let's start uh, with uh, uh, over to Eddie. Uh, can you please provide a, uh, a short presentation or introduction of block points showcasing the solutions capabilities in collecting, analyzing and correlating security event data for efficient threat detection and response? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, if you can make me a uh, presenter, and I'll be happy to share. There you go. Great. So um, I think many of you already know SIMS, where we uh, define log sources and collect those logs. And then we have alert rules that would actually trigger alerts. And we also have dashboards that will show an aggregation of the data. This is pretty much the standard capability for a SIM. But let's take it a little bit to the next step and prepare for the discussion around the integration. Basically, those alerts can trigger a playbook. And those playbooks that we're adding to those alerts can be used to do three very useful things. So the first thing we're doing is we're further enriching and further qualifying the data. We can, for example, use the data that we're getting from CyberInt and then uh, compare it to when did this user last log in? When did this user do something unusual that was detected by our UEBA anomaly detection. And by enriching them, that data, we can get a better result. So the first one is simply enriching the data and getting more context, pulling it in. Second thing we can do is automate some of those responses and make them easy. So if we know that the user hasn't changed their password in the past two weeks, but we get some compromised credits, what the system can do for you, and we'll show it shortly, is actually suspend the user and ask them to replace their password before allowing them to continue anything. And this way, even if that password leaked, you are now remediating the problem before the attacker gets to you. Last but not least, if the attacker did get to you and somebody actually used that credential in something that looks like an attack, you are able to quickly respond and run prepared playbooks that would easily remediate all the damage that was done uh, and all the progress that was achieved by that attacker. And we'll show that as well. So, Mark, would you like me to continue to uh, yeah, showing the actual integration? Yeah, I think we uh, we can move over to the part in which we uh, we are we are going to uh, to show the integration and synergy in the real world scenario. As mentioned already in the beginning, questions can be answered right now, or questions can be answered during the Q and A session. But let's move over to the uh, to the integration and synergy part. 
Uh, so uh, please go ahead, Eddie. Excellent. So you can see um, when we fetched internet facing assets, for example, that have a problem, we can look into those and we get all the information about the ones that have problems. And that information, if we look at specific artifacts, you can see that we take a specific artifact and what we can do is run a playbook related to that artifact and immediately decide to block that host because something bad happened there. Or if we have a user that is problematic, then the playbooks would immediately be relevant. Um, we can look at their role assignments, we can get their user group, we can check if they're inactive, or we could disable a user account very easily. And all of that is done by running a playbook that is tailored to handling the specific type of data. So if we look at the playbook, some very straightforward steps. You saw the alert that Gino was showing earlier. That alert would actually be used to trigger a playbook. And we'll say, OK, we're opening a case for handling compromised credentials. We got an alert about that from through the API from CyberInt. We're getting all those credentials. There may be quite a few of them. And we're building, combining the user and password together, going through a loop. There could be not just one, there could be dozens of them. And then uh, we're putting them uh, into a case, or we could be running additional playbooks that would further validate which ones of them are uh, relevant or problematic, allowing us to get efficient very, very quickly. Another nice thing that the system has is the ability to basically add those incidents to an existing case. So I showed you that we opened the case because we had some leaked credentials, but even nicer, if we have user IDs in those credentials, uh, our incident case management actually checks if some case already has that user available. So if somebody leaked my credentials and we have a case open that says, hey, Eddie has been uploading a lot of data lately, then uh, we can find that case where I'm uploading a lot of data lately. Just uploading a lot of data is not so, so bad for somebody who's doing product management. Maybe I uploaded a large build, which is the new version we're releasing. Uh, that could be okay. But now that I get that additional information from Gino saying, hey, Eddie's credentials have actually been leaked on the internet, then I start to be a lot more suspicious because I know that uh, somebody may have used those credentials to upload important data and they're not authorized. So that case is created automatically and all that data is actually viewable from one place, including the threat intelligence that is now no longer just intelligence, it becomes actionable you can immediately suspend Eddie's user to make sure that he's not doing any more damage. You can block that upload uh, and not allow any additional uploads until you make sure that I'm not doing anything stupid or worse, somebody is doing something stupid in my name because my credential was stolen. So this playbook and this correlation process allows even a beginner analyst to easily use that useful information from uh, CyberInt and be able to get results quickly. Okay, thank you for that. That's really interesting. So you're 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 basically describing a couple of use cases that you can program by using the output from the CyberInt solution. To, uh, to enhance your threat intelligence and to enhance the actions that you take from an automate, automated perspective, right? Yes, okay, interesting. And, uh, we show the leak credentials. Uh, yes. There are additional uh, stories that Gino told. For example, somebody is uh, typo squatting, is trying to register a domain 
that uh, would then be used to uh, send uh, phishing emails. And once you know about it, you can move to suspend it, but more important, you can use it, for example, to immediately warn your stock and warn even some of your power users uh, about it. If you're finding that there are certain threats on certain external assets, hey, somebody set up a new server, then you can open a ticket for, hey, the server is actually not being logged. Maybe LogPoint doesn't know about that server at all until CyberInt actually scanned the external uh, attack surface, found a new server, and immediately told us, hey, you know, those guys in, in marketing, they've set up a server. They yep. didn't even know they had to talk to security. And now uh, you're not logging it and you're not protecting it. Sooner or later, somebody is going to steal your data from that server. So this whole process can be easily automated and we're providing out of the box playbooks, uh, allowing those use cases to be operationalized. Okay, thank you for that, Addy. Uh, would you like to to add something to that, uh, Gino, for, from your perspective? Uh, is any everything covered here? I think the possibilities are well endless if you look at integration with uh, a scene. In this case, the Lockpoint solution. That that is correct. That is correct, uh, Mark. So pretty much, we we cover a range of let's say use cases, um, from from phishing to 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 uh, data, we call it attackware, uh, data leakage, uh, supply chain, for example. And all of these vulnerabilities, all of these are, are alerts that are, are generated in our platform so that the user can action on them. At the end of the day, there's certain things we can read it, like a phishing site or social media impersonation site. We can take those down if the customer initiates it, but there's other things internal to the assets, like an open port, the exposed web interface that we that we can action on. And having a, a tool like LogPoint to kick off the playbooks to help in terms of automation to to you know create a ticket, inform the right team to to take the action to remediate it and take it down, it just helps the whole process. So once the team internally um, resolves the issues we'll detect it because we will scan again the following day and we'll say hey it's been resolved and we automatically close the ticket so all in all our system do have that automation it's just the area of redeemation is where you know we help and hope the prospect uh, uh can 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 you know action on that and with tools like lockpoint they can automate that whole process uh easily yeah thank you again uh, eddie and gino you uh you reflected uh, pretty good on the power of both solutions and how they can enhance each other to to get uh, more well more valuable information uh, from your uh, from your threat intelligence that you're that you're gathering. Um, thank you for that. Uh, let's move on to the uh, the next part. Uh, we've received some questions from the uh, from the public. I want to uh, to share them with you and give you the opportunity to uh, to answer those. Um, the first question I have received is regarding the Lockpoint solution. Uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, the solution is an on-premise uh, based solution or can also be used uh, on other, uh, in other purposes. Um, the question that is asked is, can Lockpoint also function in the cloud? So yes, absolutely. Uh, we have a SaaS offering, so not only can it function from the cloud, you can hand over uh, all operations uh, to us. So we will uh, do the upgrades for you, we'll do the management for you, and you'll be able to uh, use a, a SIM without worrying about maintaining it. And of course, you can deploy the on-prem version wherever you want. So if you want to deploy to AWS or to Azure or to any other private cloud, uh, of course, you can do that as well. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, also the second question is also aimed towards uh, towards Lockpoint. Um, the, the the explanation on well, what we explained in the beginning, the licensing model, uh, no uh, no surprises out of the box, um, a, a normal model based on uh, non EPS. Uh, the question is, how does the Lockpoint licensing model exactly work? Can you explain a bit about that? 
So very simple. You're counting the number of log sources that you have, and you know that upfront. If you want, you can even uh, have a little bit of leeway, have three, four, five more in case you're going to add during the year. And with that, uh, there is a price per log source, and you don't have to worry about anything else. You don't have to worry about EPS, and you don't have to worry about storage. Neither of those are parameters uh, in the pricing. Um, for store, even nicer. Uh, out of the box, there is one free user. And only if you want to add additional analysts, would you pay uh, an additional license per analyst. Okay, and uh, what I understood is also if you want to uh, like implement the solution in, uh, in other areas or on other locations, then it's also uh, free of charge, right? You can implement the, uh, the solution uh, anywhere in, uh, in, your, uh, in your environment, as long as you're uh, abiding to the uh, pay per lock delivering device, if I'm correct. Exactly. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, a question comes in for Gino. Um, how do you detect leaked credentials? Where's the data that you're working with? Uh, where is it being collected from? So Cybrin, <clears throat> so Cybrin collects um, um, its data from multiple sources. So open source, um, deep dark web, social media. When it comes to leaked credentials, um, um, as I shown in my in my in my demonstration, um, some of them could be just files that are being uh, published online on forums or, or or can be found through Google Dorks. Uh, those are collected, and if it match if it contains any of your credentials, we 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 tend to put it under the category of third party risk, uh, third party exposed credentials. When it comes to corporate, um, uh, let's say. Uh, employee credentials we see typically that for the last five years malware info stealers have been the number one uh, source of leak credentials and the way we collect those um, are mainly on underground uh, deep work red chatter so telegram or discord and we monitor some of those chats them for any let's say conversations about um, of uh, of credentials being um, sold, so we're really looking at the initial access brokers. We're we're, we're infiltrating their 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 network and trying to understand okay what are they sharing. And we collect that and we add those as quickly as possible to our platform for our customers, so that they don't have to go on the dark web because it's eventually will add them to go on the dark web for it to be purchased and feed those hackers with you know some type of funding so that it can continue doing the modest operandi. So we try our best to collect it through other mediums and source before their their leak in the um in the deep dark web in in, in the Russian forums, Martian markets. Okay, thank you for that elaboration, Tina. Um we also have request uh, we uh, received the question if the cyber solution can also work with cloud-based assets. Can you tell a little bit more about that? Um so to the answer to that is yes. Um, <clears throat> so typically, uh, cloud-based assets, once they're externally facing, so they're open to see from the outside, Cybrin will detect those. So once we scan your, your, your assets and we see that this IP is listed in a certificate, uh, we will detect that. Um, we do have an out-of-the-box integration with cloud providers. So uh, Azure and AWS. And then what we do there is we're able to see all the assets that are hosted in the cloud. So if you are predominantly um, having your resources in the cloud, we can we can scan the resources, collect them and consume them into our attack service monitoring. And then we'll check for any exposed items from those assets. So the answer to the question is um, yes, we do. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question also about adding more automations to threat detection and response. Uh, uh, the, the, the person in, ca in this case doesn't have a SOAR. Uh, what are the options in that case? Obviously, uh, 
the lock point solution can be purchased to uh, to do the solar part but if if there are other solutions in place what are the uh, what are the options there so um so there's this uh, as i say it, without a sore um um capability then then again it's more manual work so what what you would need to do is now um um is is have a map a manual let's say map of of the individual uh responsible parties for these assets and um from there you would need to i guess engage a lot more with them to remediate the issues um so uh, it, it is feasible you, you you can work around it um um there's possibilities where you can consume some of these IOCs them directly in firewalls, not ideal, because uh, if you, by any chance, again, uh, 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 don't have a filter to rule out, let's say, Facebook or some of the, let's say, legitimate websites, you may block people getting access to these resources, uh, but it just requires a lot more manual effort. Um, so it is possible, and it really depends on your size. If it's a very small organization, um, you know, you can probably manage it, but as your organization, let's say if it's it's just two, three hundred and, and a plus or so, then automation becomes a key because um, you might never know at what point we start to detect a lot of stuff beyond the perimeter where you have a lot of air, uh, areas that you need to action on. So it is overall possible. It's just a matter of finding the right person who owns the right technology, password reset, um, vulnerability management team, um uh, domain register uh re, you know owner and those different parties you would need to reach out manually to read me the issue okay okay um, a question for both of you um what are the recommendations for automated playbooks for uh for say different kind of threats how would how should the playbooks differ from say leaked credentials to a malicious ip found in a firewall log can you explain a bit about that uh, eddie I think each and every one of those is is quite different. When you're looking at a leak credential that's related to a user. So um, a typical playbook, like we showed before, would, for example, check whether that user is active and whether they logged in recently and whether they reset their password recently. And if you get uh, a user and a password, you could check whether those user and passwords actually work. And all of those are actions you can do immediately on the leak credential information. But also, you could correlate and check to see if you have any open case uh, related to that user. And in that case, uh, pun intended, uh, you actually add the information that not only is this user uploading a suspicious amount of data, but we also know that their credentials were leaked uh, at a certain given time. And last but not least, you may want to not only check things, but actually do something to remediate. So you could suspend a user, or you could take that user out of an admin group temporarily until uh, you're happy that their risk has been reduced. They've change that password and the leak credential is not likely to uh, affect you as an organization. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Eddie. Yeah, any, uh, any additions from, uh, sorry, any additions from Gino's side? Anything you want to add, Eddie? I see you want to add one more, one more thing. Sorry. So for IP, it's different, right? For IP, you would check if something happened to that IP and you would check, for example, uh, the DNS registrar, if there is anything new registered for that IP and completely different. So depending on both the type of finding and the type of asset, uh, you would have a response playbook that you could do manually, step by step. Uh, you'd probably prefer not to do manually anything that you can automate. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to, uh, the really good points, Eddie, uh, from what I can gather there, that each case is unique. Um, I can see for each alert that we generate is quite unique. The response is, is unique. And even if it's the same issue, 
uh, uh, league credentials, right? If it's the VIP, I don't think you're going to be the same playbook as a standard user, right? So it's it's really important that um, uh, to understand, especially in terms of having a log point solution and, and a cybering that we have different alerts that will generate multiple playbooks and different, depending on the content, it will be different um, playbooks that be executed. One thing I would definitely see the beneficial of this overall solution is that as an analyst overall, that you can look at the broader picture. A lot of, or, because you are so swamped with manual effort, you don't see the bigger picture because a lot of core organization may overlook to say, okay, wait a minute, we are aren't we currently under attack by APT, all right? Just seeing the different pieces, but not having time to tie them up. But having this in or in terms of automation helps you to look at the bigger picture to say, hey, let's take more time to invest. It, it, it seems that it's an APT attack, and they're looking to target not only our middle management but our C level suite as well. So overall, I mean, this 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 the combination of two, and, and I've, I've I think we we only have nine to five to get things done, forty hours a week, depending where you where you work around the world. But the important part is that these repetitive tasks, these manual tasks, if they can be automated, let it be automated and then focus more on the bigger picture that can provide more value of what you're getting from this automation between these two solutions. Okay, thank you, Gino, for that addition. Really, really valuable. Um, yeah, let's start with, uh, let's, let's end with uh, one more question. And that's concerning Cyberint and about takedown processes. Uh, are they are these supported by Cyberint, and how do they how do these uh, usually work? A very good question. Very good question. So, uh, so I didn't really illustrate it, but to just give you a key, though, we we have our uh, takedown service, um, um, many around phishing, uh, uh, impersonating apps. Uh, fake social media profiles of the company or VIPs, or even a, a website that is coming across to be uh, legitimate, like your website, but it, it's not It's not actually, so it's infringing your brand. Um, <clears throat> overall, what we do is try proactively to detect these types of impersonation, right? Anything related to digital risk that's relevant to your, to your brand. Um, what we have is an in-house takedown uh, service, so we don't outsource it to anyone because uh, by doing that, it, it increases the SLA, and more importantly, you, you're not able to guarantee that something that's really pertinent for the business is going to get done, right? So we take that responsibility because we make that agreement with our customers that we're going to help you remediate these um, issues. So when it comes to our takedown, um, I've seen from our statistics last uh, quarter, or even the quarter before that, we've been in in most cases. 98% uh, successful in doing a takedown within 24 hours. So um, once you've submitted the takedown, uh, most of the takedown process is automated. We get it in, it's automated, it contacts the whole hosting registrar, or if it's a social media platform, it contacts the social media platform um, a company, and then we already have all the papers ready to submit to say this needs to be takedown. Once it's been received, it's handled quickly, uh, created, and we continue working with those different parts to understand how we can you know, speed the process up. So this is something that's really core to us. We've been mastering this craft for like more than, let's say, uh, going on, on, on five or even 10 years. And every time as we see new and new platforms are, are, are coming more and more um, uh, relevant for our customers, we try to understand how their, 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 their takedown process is, how it works and we inform our customers about it. So all in all, um, you know, Cyberin has that takedown service. Um, if you're ever interested in, or if you're if you're being, let's say, um, yeah, let's say heavily targeted, you, you can always reach our website. Uh, you can get a free overview of the whether if you've been seeing phishing or any any anything related to your brand. And then you can have a quick call with us for us to see how we can help you really meet those um, issues. Okay, thank you both for uh, for answering the questions. As we have no more time for answering the remaining questions, we will continue to the closing part of the session. Please note that any un unanswered questions will be answered offline after the session accordingly. We will get in touch with you about that. Um, well, as we conclude this webinar, we have learned what the challenges, pitfalls, and do's and don'ts are when organizations are going to maximize their security operations 
by using a combination of seam and attack surface monitoring. We've also spent time with the introduction of both Cyberint and Lockpoint and discussed their integration possibilities. Looking at the number of questions that we have received this afternoon, we can certainly conclude that the subject is clearly on the agenda of many visitors in this session. Of course, there's a possibility to ask any questions that have not been discussed today offline. We will also share this presentation and the contact details of the speakers for any additional questions. So yeah, that's it, folks. Thank you again for your attendance. And thank you, uh, thank you to our panelists of today. We look forward to welcoming you uh, on our future panel sessions and webinars, of course. The next session is planned for the 21st of May, and the main content is NIST2 from a CISO's perspective. So I want to say thank you very much again. Stay tuned for more. Bye bye. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Gino. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Have a good, good rest of your day. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye bye.